It is the hard thing about reality competition shows is there are way more losers than there are winners. Yeah, that's the truth. We're in a large group, but I've got a new family now. I'm with you guys. Yes, you are a part of the family. You earned the apron, which is, that alone is not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. Nobody tells you how hard it's going to be, but that part was probably the hardest. All right, Chris. <laughs> yes, sir. Welcome, welcome to a bunch of losers. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah, man, it's it, it is the hard thing about reality competition shows. Is there are way more losers than there are winners. <laughs> yeah, that's the truth. Right? We, uh, the truth. We are in a uh, we're in a large group, but uh, we got a new family now. I'm, I'm with yes. you guys. <laughs> You are you are a part of the family. You earned the apron, which is that alone is not easy. It's not easy. It's not easy. Nobody tells you how hard it's going to be, but that part was probably the hardest. Yeah, yeah. Most uh, anytime, you know, someone's like, "Oh, you were on MasterChef. How was that?" I'm like, "The hardest thing I've ever done in my life." Very true. <laughs> Very yeah, true. No. And you went through it twice, right? Crazy, right? Uh, glutton yeah. for punishment, man. Glutton for punishment. Second time was was rough because, like, the first time I'm like naive going into it, right? Like, I, I'm not even considering anyone else's cooking skills because I'm just like, I'm here to win this thing, you yeah. know. Um, <laughs> and and it's not thinking about what I'm doing. Is it technically? Uh, correct or incorrect like am I following following traditional uh, chef technique on certain things like I was just making it up as I was going along you know but then all the time I spent between then and the second time I did it I learned a lot of stuff yes and so that was all in my head and kind of in my way I was like technically if I'm gonna do this I don't have enough time so do I, so in my head, I'm thinking, do I do it in a way where I make it happen? And then are, is Gordon Ramsay going to go, well, you didn't do it correctly. Like, yeah. like before I didn't know what correct was. So it was like, it didn't That's matter. Right. I'll get, I'll get to, I'll get to from point A to point B, however I need to. That's right. So that yeah. that kind of got in my head a lot, but anyway, whatever. Interesting. Interesting. That, Cause I, um, I know some techniques, but um, you know, I'm really a home cook. I've never worked in a restaurant. Uh, I worked at a little fast food place when I was a kid. That was about it. Self-taught for the most part, you know, YouTube and that's about it. And, and so, yeah. um, so I knew some techniques and I had plenty of knife skills and skills that I thought would carry me forward. And, um, but it was challenging to get there and then to stay there was even more challenging. <laughs> yeah. That's staying, man. It's like, people don't when they're watching it on tv they're not considering like what time you're waking up in the morning the nerves that you have in your stomach that just don't go away yes like yes you know and in fact like every day that goes by you're like looking at the odds and it's just getting more and more intense (laughs) yeah yeah so the 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 anxiety is going up the you're like developing ulcers basically (laughs) um yeah, it's crazy. That's a, that's a tough time. Uh, I'm I'm very thankful to be a part of it. It was extremely fun. You know, you meet some really cool people. You have similar uh, ideas and and goals in mind, and and you learn from each other. It was a cool experience, but uh, intense, intense. And uh, I but I pull, I came away with a lot of um, a lot of new skills, a lot of new friends, a lot of new uh, you know the different feelings about myself and my my strengths my weaknesses, you know, all that. Yeah, for sure. It's, um, it's one of those things where you, you just, you don't, you're going in thinking, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to cook. I got to face Gordon Ramsay. I got to compete against these other people. And then really you get there and you make a lot of friends. You make, you, you make, you, you, you become a family in a kind of way. And, and then you find, you really find out who you are too, right? Like, yes. Like what, what kind of stress can you handle? And, and so on. Yeah, I was, I was enjoying the, not enjoying the stress, but I was taking it comfortably. I was really trying to 
like you said, make it up along the way. Cause I just didn't have maybe enough skill to really be able to do everything. And, uh, but that, that also allowed me to do things that I didn't know I couldn't do, like you're saying. And, and I definitely made some, uh, some decisions that probably weren't the best, especially my first, uh, real challenge. I, I made beignets and stuffing with etouffee, crawfish etouffee, and I've never made a beignet before. And it was, a, I think it was a 45 minute challenge. Um, and it was, it was incredible. I pulled off three beignets and only one of them looked good. And I was able to stuff it and my plate just was lacking. And, and I thought right then I said, that's, that's it. I'm going home, man. First, first one, but it didn't happen. So I learned, I learned big time that, that, that is crazy. I can't like, yeah. I mean, to do a beignet and never done it before. <laughs> I like the idea of that. So you like a savory and- beignet? And those are my two favorite yeah. things. As a kid, I always remembered going to the French Quarter in New Orleans where I grew up uh, when I was a young man and uh, or a youngster. And that's where I would uh, always get beignets every time we went, the zoo, uh, all that kind of stuff. And then um, and then as I grew up, I always loved crawfish etouffee and things like that, especially I remember my family making it and it was always just great and comforting. And, and so I just thought, combine those. That's the elevation. And, and it did, it did actually taste good and it worked and, and I, I probably have to do it again at home and, and, uh, try it again. Cause you know, there it's so intense. Well, right. I don't, I don't remember like seeing that in the, in the cut did, no, it did didn't it not get it. like, yeah, it didn't get featured. No, no. That's also the hard part, man, because like early on, let's be honest, like they're, they, not only do they have to show off your cooking skills but they're also trying to build the story for America to latch on to. Right. Like, like, so it's got to go hand in hand. And also if you do have really good chops, but they want to save you for later, they can, you know, I feel like I was, uh, they had, they were building a story for me because they knew when I was going out at that point. So when you see the edits, I feel like I was more present at the beginning. I said, ah, they're just setting me up for this. I knew the end, the end result. So, it's of it's course. unique how they uh they chop all that up and make it i guess work for their story it's yeah very interesting i mean it's it's definitely hard to go watch it back um knowing the outcome it is because <laughs> you know you can't tell anyone everyone no. around is rooting rooting for you and thinks you you know thinks you went all the way or wants you to go all the way and yes. you know you gotta hold on to that secret man we we had a, a viewing party at a restaurant and, um, and everybody thought it was going to be like great news. Uh, but, but it was not. And so everybody turned and looked at everyone in the room was surprised and it was a lot of people. So it's tough. It's tough. Even, and even that time that was tough, uh, to know, to know that day that I was about to, you know, I felt like I was going to let everybody down, you know, but everybody was very proud of me and all that kind of stuff. But it, you still feel like yourself, like you're going to let everybody down. Cause like you said, they don't know, the outcome they think they're there for some great celebration probably assuming that and uh so that part's tough that part's tough but it's that part's tough. really tough I, I had a i had to throw a party for the finale for the first time mm. because i was in the finale and if if i didn't throw a party everyone would are like they would be like oh he didn't win and i had like everybody was believing i was gonna win oh. and so I threw this party where I went, I went to my hometown in, in Florida and I, I got this restaurant to host it. I got two radio stations there. I had sponsors. I had the wow. restaurant paying me money to be there. Wow. This, this party, there was over 500 people that showed up. It was <laughs> packed wall to wall. That's and then I'm sitting there in the middle going, this is going to be, <laughs> this is going to end terribly. <laughs> Yeah, oh, do, uh, do a couple me. shots to handle that one. There was not enough alcohol in that building that night. Oh, that's tough. That's a that's a real tough one. Yeah. So you said okay. You said you grew up. You grew up in New Orleans or Alabama. Well, I was I was born in New Orleans. Uh, my grandmother uh, lived on the bayou, so I, I vacationed there a lot, and that's where I got a lot of my fishing, my hunting, my uh, uh, the stuff on the bayou growing up. And, uh, and we lived with, uh, when I went out there, I just visited out there, but when I did, uh, there was very little, you didn't have running water. We didn't have, we, so we had a, 
the, you had electricity. That was about it. So it was a unique experience as a kid to, you know, go hunt and fish and bring it home. And then my grandmother just, no matter what, I catch a soft shell crab at six in the morning. She would say, clean that thing and bring it in. I'm going to get the grease hot. And she would just cook it for me right then. It was like the most amazing experience as a kid. So that really like got me going and, and wanting to, to cook. And, and then I moved to Alabama when I was 10 years old. And, um, and everything and got was, electricity. Yeah, we got electricity. <laughs> Bro, you're not old enough to not, you're not old enough to live in a time without electricity. What the <laughs> hell? No, no. It was just because this can't, this place my grandmother lived was, was in the bayou and there was no roads to get to it. So you just got to it by boat. So yeah, I'm not that old for sure. It's just like I had, I had power in my, my home where I lived with my family, but I spent a lot of weekends and all, like sometimes I would spend the entire summer out there. And if I didn't, I had to work with my dad in construction. So it really was the better of the experience for me, as far as I'm concerned. Because my grandmother just gave us freedom and let us just go out and do whatever. And it well, was yeah, because she didn't she didn't have a TV. She didn't have <laughs> she didn't have anything to occupy you with. You're like, no, no, dude. That's I cannot even imagine. Forty. Well, well, how old are you? Forty five. I'm forty six now. I'm forty six. Uh, that was. Um, uh, in the in the the early eighties. So let's say 40, 40 years ago, like yeah. 80, 82, <laughs> yeah. 84? Yeah, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, we had we had all the feet, uh, running water and electricity and and all the stuff we have now. But uh, but out there you couldn't. We would literally we would dip water. I'm, I'm it's crazy. We would take a five gallon bucket and dip water out of the bayou and carry it in, and that's what we used to flush the toilets. Whoa! Yeah, yeah. You were off grid. It was like the original off grid. It was, uh, it was, but it was exciting. It was fun. It was awesome. Now, when you say like, okay, explain to me, you're on the bayou, meaning like, is this house floating? No, like, you're you're on the bank of the bayou, so okay. the water's right there. You have a boat that would be your driveway, in real terms, and then, uh, and but you would, it was you know, twenty five minutes in a boat, maybe thirty minutes to the a launch where you could actually there was a store and. And we could buy seafood uh, and, and things. There was like a bunch of seafood right there for sale at a little gas station. And that was about it. And then my, that's where my parents would pick me up or or uh, one of my family members would pick us up. And that's how you got back and forth. So really, when we needed water, fresh water, like drinking water and cooking water, we would go there and just fill up our containers. And then we'd fill up on meats and berries and we'd ride back and we'd be out there for a week or two. And then we'd back and forth. It was incredible. So grandma was tough. She was tough, man. They featured her a lot in the newspaper every, you know, five or 10 years, you know, the lady of the bayou. Cause she was the only one that lived out there. Everybody else would visit on the weekends. They were like camps to. Yeah, yeah we need, we need a bath. We need electricity. <laughs> <laughs> Wash my hair. Wash my hair. Oh, if we didn't catch a lot of rainwater, uh, cause sometimes the, in between, we didn't have enough water. And so we always call it rainwater and that's what we bathe in. But if you didn't catch rainwater, you didn't bathe in drinking water. You bathed in bayou water. And so you would get clean with soap and then you would still be dirty from the water. Cause, cause it's, it's, it's not the cleanest water. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's dirty from all the, you know, the bayou, man. Dude, this is wild. <laughs> I loved it out there, man. I loved it out there. Do you, does the family still own the house? Is, is, what's, no, uh, uh, my parents bought a place next to it for a while. And then when we left there, we sold it. And about, uh, 10 years after we left or so, my grandmother really got, she would fall over and things from time to time and, and started forgetting things. So we had to, we had to get her off the bayou. And not long after that, she passed. And then we, we just yeah. had to sell the place. Damn. Yeah. I would love to have it now. It was, it was just a camp, you know, it was run down, it was built on pylons and, and it flooded every time a hurricane came through and you'd have to remodel it and fix it back. It was, it was, but uh, you know, my grandmother loved it and, and my family supported that. And it was incredible though. We really had a, um, a good time growing up. My cousin and I, they showed him on the show, just a picture of us boys uh, fishing and, and we would yeah. just always be barefooted, no shirt. A uh, fishing pole, tackle box, bucket to put our fish Huck, in. And... Huckleberry Finn out there. Huh? <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. You know, no cell phones. It was before all that. Before that. When it Look, man, I, like, I feel like a lot of our country right now would definitely trade in everything for that for at least a week. 
Yeah, yeah, no like longer than week that week. Four days yeah. or so. Uh, I mean, enough enough uh, bayou water in a bucket to flush <laughs> down your toilet. You'd, it, you know what it would do? It would humble a lot of people, that's for sure. It, I think that's Man. why I'm so humbled today is that um, it, where I grew up was a little – it was a little rough, you know, it wasn't rough, but it was, uh, it was tough. And, and we pushed and my dad would have us working. My mom made sure we got our studies and, and she pushed hard for that. So we were pushed intently hard. And, uh, but, but I, but it was, uh, it was like not tough living. I don't want to sound like I came up and it was real tough. It just was, um, just different. Yeah. It's just different. You know, you had less, less of the, of the expensive stuff, I guess, maybe, I don't know, but it was, it was fun. It was fun. I look back at that part of my life. It's one of my favorite parts. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like what Gen X has is this, this different weird experience because like for me as, as the millennial that I am, I always find myself where I can talk to anybody. Yeah. Um, I can relate with all the new kids coming up and, and can talk. I can talk shop with them about, you know, all their, tech savvy shit because like i was in high school when the internet showed up and it was like (laughs) we were we were the ones that were figuring out the internet and made it what it is today right that's right that's right you know and no offense to you to gen x but gen x was standing over our shoulder going that's not gonna stick around yeah yeah (laughs) well i I went to school and i remember we learned how to turn on and off computers that was it (laughs) like we were in i was only in like the fourth grade or something it was apple and it was like the green screen and it was yeah. very basic and we just learned how to boot them up as they used to say and boot them down yeah. and it was uh very basic stuff but uh yeah you, you you had the internet and you started just pushing that thing and it's i mean that's changed the world the world but yeah right. you know like so i i have this i'm in this weird like limbo where i have friends that are you know my age and then 10 years older than me, 20 years older than me. I got friends that are 30 years older than me. (laughs) And then, you know, and then I got like friends that are 20, 21, 22. And it's like, you know, like being around them, like I I have to like be around them because that's the only way I'm learning and keeping up with the new shit. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's, uh, that's an incredible place to be right in the middle, you know, where you have the, the people a little older than you that you can learn from and the people younger than you that are giving you the more, the, the tech stuff. And that's incredible. Nice yeah. place to be. It's weird. It's definitely weird. <laughs> so where are you now? Are you still in Alabama? I'm in Alabama. Yeah. So I've been here since I was 10. Um, I've got, I've, I've now turned in, uh, I used to work as a construction worker with a family business. And now I am a real estate investor. I invest in, okay. I buy houses and um in some tough shape sometimes and i renovate them fix them up and rent them out and so yeah so i'm i'm in that field now which is similar i still you know i'm glad i grew up with all the construction knowledge but now i use that and you know that keeps me busy yeah Three kids a wife they keep me busy um and there's Three a small kids. kids i've got uh 10 6 and 5 so wow. i got three, three young ones Wow. I also have a um a small farm in the back. I have uh chickens and ducks and rabbits, a couple pigs. Uh cats nice. are back there hanging out, taking care of all the rodents. So it's I got I got a busy a busy a busy schedule. Yeah, well. you, you got a little compound over there. You put the <laughs> kids to work, you get you teach them how to work out on that farm? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. And they love it, man. The kids that's really why we got a lot of animals is we got them for the eggs, the chickens for the uh for eggs and and then the kids just love playing with them. So we started like taking on animals and um, a couple people just can't take care of the animals anymore because of certain situations. And we've taken them on and, and I give them good home. And I, I really, uh, I really try to keep them happy and healthy. They get to roam pretty wow. free. I don't have them all caged up and everything. So the kids nice or the chickens, home. sir, the kids or the chickens, <laughs> the chickens, <laughs> The kids run wild, you know, they, they <laughs> have run into the whole place and the, the area for the animals. They get all the, Dude, all I, the fun. I joke all the time, but sometimes in my head, it, it feels like it, it should be real, but these kids have insane energy and they don't understand the value of money. So they should be working. 
They it, should like, be working. McDonald's <laughs> and and Seven Eleven, like the get like it, put a six year old behind the, the register at Seven <laughs> Eleven and let him like ring everybody up all day. I don't like. I can't like when I see like a, a person that's like in their forties and they just look like they've given up on life and they're chain smoking cigarettes, working behind the counter. It's like, man, have kids. You should have kids and really nice. they work for you yeah. and you get free money. <laughs> yeah, my uh, my kids love to uh, to work when it when it benefits them, like uh, white lemonade stands, selling the chicken yeah. eggs. Man, they go yeah. they go hard and they will in the middle of the heat. I'll be out there with them. And I'll have to suffer and endure through the conditions, but I'm like, we got to get a tent out here. This is this is hot. I need to go get some water. Y'all are y'all are crazy out here, but I stay out. And there they can working. handle it. They can handle it. Yeah, they can, they can handle it. I mean, I look. I did the same thing when I was a kid. I would do the lemonade stand, but I did it with um, my dad. Always had the powdered Gatorade. And okay, do you remember okay. um, the Tang? Do you remember Tang? It's tang, yeah, yeah. So my dad would would have those powders, and he would you know he'd make a water bottle and take it to work. And we're like, oh, dad likes this stuff. We live on a busy street. Forget lemonade. Let's do a Tang and Gatorade stand. <laughs> and we did, and and we set it up, and we sold it all, and we'd make like we'd make like a hundred bucks yeah. selling the shit for a couple bucks, and and then my dad came, <laughs> my dad came, we had it all cleaned up. My dad came home, and he was like, he was like, the next morning waking us up he's like where's my tang you guys drank all my tang we're like no no we 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 did go, we made us we made a tang stand and he's like what he's like you made it he's like what's okay. a tang stand well, <laughs> he's like he's like where's my cut and we're like what he's like well you used my tang where's yeah. my cut and nice. then we learned how to be entrepreneurs <laughs> there you go yeah you turn a three dollar container of tang into you know a hundred bucks. It's not bad. Uh, my daughter and, and boys they do extremely well because a lot of people don't want their change and and a lot of people yeah. just give them a twenty and take a couple glasses of lemonade. I'm like, this is not the way the real world works. You know, this is you won't always get extra money for things, but you know, enjoy it while Wait, you're a kid. Could you imagine if we put all the kids into the workforce and then that's how it did work? <laughs> At McDonald's, you're leaving a hundred dollar bill. I don't know. Just here, keep the change. Yeah, here, keep the change. Tell, yeah. tell your mother I said hi. That's right. That's right. It could be. Profitable. I don't know. Maybe it's profitable. maybe China's on to something. They don't their kids be. work? Oh, they might be. Jeez. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. I did. You know, I did when I started my cookie company. I was reading just like trying to figure out tax breaks and benefits and all that kind of stuff. And I did read that if you do have a family owned business your kids can work and you can actually like legally put them on the payroll and the payroll like goes into an account for them when they turn 18 so you, you actually can if it's your own business if it's your own children and it's your own business yeah. you can pay yeah. them i think it's seventeen thousand dollars a year each and you right. can use that for their education and it's tax-free too right. so you can use it right away if it's for education pretty impressive i got three kids that would be like 60 or i mean uh i'd be like uh 40 or fifty thousand dollars i could put right and uh next free they don't they don't run that commercial <laughs> right yeah. yeah that's that's but that's what they're incentive for entrepreneurs you have to um you have to use all the incentives if you want to be profitable that's the reason i'm in real estate i was always in construction because that's what i knew and i was comfortable in and uh, it's where my family was in, and all my family. Uh, you know, I'm like a fourth generation carpenter. Uh, it's just in my family. And my wife wanted to buy a house and renovate it and flip it. Yeah. And I just had to really learn some things. And we got on a television show for this house called First Time Flippers. And they follow you around and watch you remodel the house. And they're just like quiet. They don't do anything. But I watched their program after we signed up for it. And I realized they really make fun of these poor people that have no idea what they're doing. And I said, I just can't be one of those guys. So I really learned everything I could. And I didn't have any real big mistakes. And they didn't really make fun of me too much. <laughs> but you did do the show. Yeah, we did the show. It aired um, about six months after we, we got done with the house. And, and then we were going to flip it. And then we moved in it. And we rented our first home to our first home together, we rented that. And then we realized all the tax breaks that are in real estate that you really can 
I don't really pay anything in, in income tax because of all the write-offs that I have doing real estate the way I do things. Wow. Yeah. So that's, that's really my real full-time job is, is buying, renting, really, uh, refinancing my real estate. Wow. Well, you got to start thinking about teaching a course. <laughs> yeah, I should, I should, because, uh, if more people did this, um, cause the corporations are doing what I'm doing, the big corporations. Yeah. And so if more people like me did it, there'd be a more real estate for, for regular middle-class families to buy. And yeah, instead of, the- well, okay. So we skipped over like my major question, my major question that I normally ask first. Yes. We like, we got so we got so into it, which I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, such a good conversation. I mean, obviously, we got like kind of the gist of who you are here. But <laughs> what's the moment? Where where are you in life? What are you doing that you're like? I gotta go on Master Chef, especially you know at 45 years old. <laughs> like you know, these young kids can run circles. Like, I mean, what was the motivation? Where were you? What were you doing? And, and how did you just decide like master chef is going to be the next thing? I kind of, it kind of led into it by, it wasn't like, it was one day, but leading up to that, my wife, um, was trying different diets like keto and things like that. And my kids were young and I was starting to cook for them. And I realized that our food was not the healthiest thing that you're buying and we're consuming. So I would, start cooking more for my family. And as I did that, I started, you know, doing better cooking and learning more techniques and really impressing my family. And then my wife would take pictures of my food. And then I was like, well, if you're going to take a picture, I've got to garnish it and make it look nice. So I just started doing that. Well, then she kind of got all her friends were watching these, these uh, dishes I was making. And, and then my sister comes up one day and she's like, uh, you know, master chef is hosting. I mean, is, um, is uh, looking for people, contestants. Um, I'm thinking about trying out. You should definitely try out. And I was like, oh yeah, kind of, you know, laughed it off a little bit. And my wife was there and she's like, you're, you're definitely going to do that. You'd be so good at that. Uh, your personality is great for TV. You, you've done it before. You know what you're doing. Your cooking's gotten so much better. It's so good now that I think you should do it. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And finally, you know, she, she's a strong woman. So she pushed me enough. And I was like, you know, I can do this. So she, she always has believed in me way more than I believe in myself. And she sees like that you can do really good at this. And so instead of just staying there, I said, fine. Yeah, I'll do it. That's, you know, sign me up. You do all the computer, get me on there and I will make the videos and uh, we'll see what happens. And we sent everything in and the lady calls and she says, um, you know, uh, got all my information. They loved the little Bayou story of how I grew up on the Bayou. And, um, and she said, if you don't hear from us in two weeks, then you're not on, on our list. Don't worry about it. And I said, okay, thanks. 15 minutes later, man, she calls right back. And they asked me all the other questions and then they gave me the list of, of homework to do. And, and then, you know how it goes. It's like every day you got to pump out a video or come up with some recipes or, now that you've done that, I need three more recipes, you know, show me some knife skills. Uh, I need to see something live where you never uh, have edited it, you know, just record for an hour of you cooking a dish. And uh, so, you know, I did all that stuff. And then they call and they're like, okay, you're going to LA. I was like, oh. Well, well, that's all good, except I have a farm and three little kids and my wife is working uh, at the time. And... Uh, and so anyway, we, we made it work though. I, I, uh, I got, this guy was working with me and he helped with the farm and my wife took over with the kids real, real heavy with what I was doing and, and they made it through and got on the show. <laughs> there you go. Dang. When you were in your auditioning process, what was the, what was the first thing you cooked for them? The first thing I cooked was, um, was shrimp and grits. The one I you was my apron challenge, the, um, on the show. Okay. And I realized okay. why they liked it. It's because that Bayou of, yeah. from, from when I was a kid, because that was the thing, the generations. I didn't know at the time because I made a chicken Parmesan that they never even asked me about. I made a, um, a couple other dishes and uh, had nothing to do with the Bayou. And they were like, ah, we need to know about your roots. Yeah. Well, look, they, in, 
they were able to match the dish to your story. And that's, that's what a lot of people like my advice to anyone that is going to try out for master chef or, or hell's kitchen or any of the, any of the cooking competition shows, like you, you it's got to match your story. Yeah. You know? Your story must match your dishes and what you present to them needs to be yeah. story. Yeah. Which, which doesn't mean that they're only going to push you forward. If your food matches your story. No, Yeah. It, it means, you have you still have to cook good. That's right. <laughs> but it's not a fit in your story. Yeah. yeah, they still want to check your food. Like when we got to LA, you know, they don't tell you anything. You have no idea really what you're doing. They tell you regularly that you're still not on the show, but they've flown us out there and there's like 80 of us and uh, and we just get a big room and you have no idea. You have no, I mean, no clue is what's about to go on. I thought we were going to be there learning to let's say like, uh, how to be sanitary on in on the set or how to uh i don't know i don't know use knives safely i thought <laughs> cook a whole lot i thought that we cook a lot and then you get there and it's, it's definitely different the cooking's like that it's the least part uh of the of the of the whole thing i would tell people uh that being on a cooking show is the least amount of cooking i ever did it it absolutely i got sick of ordering food i don't eat out at all really once a month maybe so i cook all of our meals and and uh and then having to order and being stuck in that hotel that's uh that's yeah. tough man we had <laughs> big big willie and shane in our all-star season but got a crock pot and they were cooking in the hotel room <laughs> yeah i almost ordered one i had my wife i didn't know how long i didn't know how long this thing was really? going to go on but i was like i need like a hot plate and a set of pans and I'll get uh, Instacart to bring me some groceries over here. I, I need a knife. I was, uh, yeah. I, but you know, you think you're going to cook. I even tried to get in the back of the hotel kitchen and they were like, oh yeah. no, 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 you can't come back here. Cause they were like big fans of the show. And so I thought for sure. Yeah, and also we've all tried that. You're not the first one. <laughs> so they know that shit's coming. They know it, they know it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're already ready for it. They're like, oh no, no, we're big fans, but no, no. <laughs> You can't be yeah, back here yeah. cutting things up. Season season fourteen, they've already seen everything backstage. Yes, yes, they know all the tricks. They know all the tricks. Yeah, man, we had some crazy stuff happen backstage when um, when uh, you when you got to the hotel and it was eighty of you. Do you remember how they told you you were making it to the next round on the TV? And do you remember how they got rid of the other people? Well, I yes, yes. They didn't really tell us, but they did uh, say they wanted that they, they split us up into two groups, approximately forty people, so that they could take half to kitchen, test kitchen, and then half to interviews. And so we did that for a couple of days. It seemed like you did an interview yep. day, and then you did a cooking day. So I did an interview yep. day first, uh, which is you know it's pretty stressing to try to do that for that long uh and be into it that long is tough but uh but i did i did pretty good i felt like i didn't do as good as i wanted of course every time i did something at master chef i felt like i could have done better and then uh and then the we found out from all the other contestants the 40 that went that day about the culinary about the test kitchen stuff and so then i felt a little relieved because they told us how it went and it was one of your dishes so i just studied all my dishes made sure i remembered everything and when I got there, that was that was no problem for me. Um, cooking and having just a couple of the the uh, test kitchen uh, chefs come by and ask you one or two questions at most is totally different when you get out on the set. Yeah, because they're that's still the auditioning process. They're making sure, like, okay, are you good on camera? Can you interview? Can you answer our questions the way we need them answered? And then, can you cook under pressure? Can you cook while we're okay. talking to yeah. you? And is it going to taste good? It's got to be seasoned and and and, and look good right. and, and all the things that they expect on the show. Yeah, because prior to that, they're judging everything off of off of stuff from video and pictures. So, That's right. like again, you can make it look good but mm -hmm. not taste good. Yes. But so then, when did they? How did they tell you all? You're the you're the forty making it to the on camera apron audition and how did they send the other 40 home? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember we got checked out of the hotel, all 80 of us. I remember we were checked out of the hotel and we're all down there. We got our luggage and, uh, 
and we knew somehow we knew that they were going to uh, cut us by half. They had told us in a meeting that we'd check out and that's what we we're going to find out. So I took the little uh, luggage tag they gave us and I wrote like my name and top 40 on there. Cause I knew I was like, I'm going to be top 40. I got to be top 40. I was like, at least got to do should've that. Wrote, I should have wrote top 10. Yeah, I should have. <laughs> I should have, but I wrote top 40. I'm like, I am going to be top 40. Cause all this effort, I'm like, at least if you make top 40, you get a, a shot in apron, you get you get your, your family gets to be there and all these things happen. And so I put my luggage tag on there and later the handlers told me how funny that was because they didn't know, they don't know the results either, the handlers. And they, they had two big box trucks outside and they were uh, putting the luggage, one person's luggage at a time following a list. And they kept splitting one one set of luggage would go to this van and later another set over here. So we were all watching thinking, well, that person's really good. I hope I'm in that van with them. Their luggage just went there. And so you're, you're really hoping that you're going together and, and you, uh, and then all of a sudden they, they took us, we went to the, the mall for some reason, they took us to the mall for a couple of hours. And, uh, then the, when we, when we got done there, I guess they were done what they needed to do. They split us up into some vans and, that's it. Half were gone and half were there. Dude, that's so crazy. It's such a like some of it sometimes it just feels so like like a Jason Bourne moment. <laughs> like you're just like this the psychology of it is just wild. It is. We so when you're, the, when you're in the studio and you pull in, you usually stop right by the door. Well, they kept going and in the back this was nighttime, by the way, and at night there's some like light set up some big tripod lights set up in the back and mounds of luggage. And I was like, Oh no, this doesn't look good. And then they passed, <laughs> they passed that up and they drove back to the studio. And this is just in the back of the studio. It wasn't a big loop. And they dropped us off in the studio and that's how they kind of separated yeah. us out. And then that's when they told us like your top boy. That's so crazy. Yeah. So uh, that's so crazy. So now eight seasons prior season, right? Eight, yeah, season yeah. six. You're six, yeah. We get told we're top 100. So they brought 100 of us to the hotel in L.A. I was already living in L.A. So, but I had to get dropped off at the airport because they didn't want people to tail me because they didn't want me to know where, like, where I was going. So I got dropped off at the airport and I had to wait at the airport. And then they came up to me and they had a plastic bag and they were like, Put your phone in. You're coming with us. And I was like, wait, I got to say bye to people. They're like, no, you got to, we're going right now. You got to put your phone in. And I like literally put my phone in without saying bye to anybody. <laughs> it's crazy. Just disappeared. Yes. Yes. It's and then, then we go to the hotel and there's a hundred of us. And it was like the first two days, uh, we were all like, people were still just traveling in. So everyone's like getting to know each other. And we're like hanging out in the lobby. And there's just like a shit ton of people. And everyone wants to talk about their food. And I'm just like, I don't want to talk about food with any of you because I don't want any of you to know what I can do. That's like, right. I'm like, I'm so sh I'm like listening to these conversations. Like, why are all of you telling all of your secrets, like tricks and secrets and like, yeah, y'all are crazy. <laughs> so then we had roommates. We had a, so we were all, I don't know how they do it now, but uh, we had a we had a bunk mate for like the first few days. Actually, for we had a bunk mate up until we got our aprons wow um yeah so the first hundred um i forget this kid's name but i can see his face but he worked for the hawaiian roll company king's hawaiian rolls that's right anyway we had we had a room together and uh they would come take us one at a time we'd go to do the interviews we'd go to set and do the the cooking uh the the practice cooking um what did you call them? Test kitchen thing. Yeah, the test kitchen. I don't know what the test really kitchen days. <laughs> yeah, test kitchen. We do the test kitchen days, and then I remember they were like, they were like, you're gonna find out at 11 a.m. tomorrow. So I have all your bags packed. 11 a.m. We're gonna become getting you all out of your rooms. 11:05 shows up with no knock on the door. 1130 so then i pulled out my journal and i just every 10 minutes i started writing down the time wow just like i just kept writing down the time writing down the time and then i was like still nothing still nothing and then like kept going and then finally it was like three o'clock 
I mean, like hours had gone by. And there's a knock at the door, and the guy, JP, uh, JP goes, uh, he's like looking at, he's like, uh, I need, uh, I need Derek to follow me. And I was like, oh, I got picked before this guy. I, that, that's gotta be good. Right. <laughs> and then he, he takes me down downstairs through the lobby and we go into, uh, one of the, the, um, ballrooms Okay, and I'm in the ballroom and there's a, just a bunch of chairs and there's, I don't know, maybe 20 people in this room. And I'm looking around and I'm like, that person's not good. That person's not good. Like I've watched them in the test kitchen. Yes. And I'm like, that per- I'm like, I'm like, I'm not in the right room. Wow. Cause I was like, I was counting like five or six people. I was like, <laughs> they, these people are not good. That's right. And, and all I'm thinking is fuck dude. Like this is it. Yeah. And then the producers come in, but then there was like a couple people that were like good. And I was like, well, maybe they're just like, maybe we're going to be like, told to come back next year. I don't know. Like I was I was stressed in this room like you would not believe. <laughs> yeah. Because I because of the amount of people that I knew were in this room that were not good. Yeah. And then Yaz and the other producers come in and they sit down on the table and they were like, "We're so sorry guys. We have to tell you that you got to call your jobs and tell them you're not coming home cuz you're staying." <laughs> and it was like we fucking went crazy. Oh my gosh. And what I learned in that moment is you got to have some people that are not good in in the beginning because you need people to win aprons and you need people to go home. You need people to go home. That's right. That's right. So I was like, seven. okay. And so then here's where it got crazy. There was vans out the back door of this ballroom. The ballroom that we were in had a back door outside. And they were like, before we went into that ballroom, they had already taken our luggage and loaded it up on, on the vans. And they were like, "You guys need to go out to this van, um, and we're gonna we're gonna take you to another hotel." And we we're like, "What?" And so they shuffled us out the back door. We get in this van. They they drive us over to another hotel. And apparently, the sixty people that did not make it that day, like some of them, like l- literally had to be escorted out by police. Like they threw tantrums. They were breaking shit. They were threatening to fight everybody. (laughs) We heard some crazy shit. That must be why they, they, they took us all out of the hotel. They told us we were going to check in another hotel. That was what they told us. And then you go and they're like, but something's come up. Uh, So with all this rain, we just had, because it was like crazy rain the day before. And so they were like, so we we need a little time. We're going to go to the mall. And then after the mall, they split you in the van. So it's just similar to you. You're riding around in that van and you're like, okay, some of these people are great. And some of these people aren't. So I wonder who, wh- which van I'm on. So I realized that another guy there, his name's Chris. My name's Chris. So I was like, oh no, two Chris's, the same van. Yeah. Then this other guy says, I'm a Chris too. And then another guy says, I'm Chris as well. Four Chris's. I kid you not. I'm like, you're like, fuck. I'm in the wrong bus. There's no, <laughs> there's no way they need four Chris's. The four Chris's are going home. And Geeks is Chris. Chris Geekson. Uh, right. Uh, Mert is a Chris, and Christopher is a Chris, and me being Chris. So all and you all us, made it on. All four of us made it on in that same bus that I thought we, we were all going home. Sometimes, sometimes I think they do that <laughs> just to fuck with you too. Because when I was in season twelve, there was Derek Prince and then me. And I was like, there's no way they're taking both of us. Yeah. That's all I thought. There's no way. And then they didn't. Derek Prince didn't get an apron, which was crazy because his shit looked so good. Wow. But but wow. he was also in a very tough challenge. The people that were in his group were very tough. So, yeah, that one, you know, so sometimes I think they do that. They're like, well, let's put all Chris's and we'll fuck with them. <laughs> mess with it. Yeah, because you ride around and you just know there's no way. There's no way they're taking all Chris's. Speaking of, of shirtless Mert, uh, <laughs> uh, Mert, so... You got you, Mert and Adam have done a few videos together, yeah? That's right. They, uh, I have a rental property on Dolphin Island, which is uh, an island right off the coast of Alabama, and it's uh, I have a rental a beach house there. And so I invited uh, Adam was passing through. We had talked there in L.A. about possibly getting together at a later date um, after we made yeah. top twenty and got to know each other better. 
and uh and they wanted to make videos they were all about it so i was like man y'all come down to alabama and we can do this so about a month or two a couple months after we got back adam was leaving colorado from his one job going back home in georgia and so he contacted me and said he might where where would i where do i live exactly and you know kind of work work things out and I said, man, you come on. That'd be awesome. He said, I man, I talked to Mert. Mert said he'll come over too because Mert's from Florida. I said, man, that'll be great. Let's do this. So I, I, I uh, penciled in us to come to the beach house. We got lights and our cameras all together. And uh, and we, we just cooked about 10 dishes all together, our, all of our ideas together. And we even actually made three different duck dishes one day. We harvested ducks here at my property. And then we took the ducks. So I showed him how to do all that stuff. And then, uh, then we took the ducks with us and we made a few, uh, a duck dish competition kind of had my 95 year old uncle judge it. And, uh, yeah, cause he lives down there. Does he have, does he have electricity? Yes, he does for sure. This is actually my wife's uncle from, uh, from New Jersey. He came down to visit us and uh, oh, okay. on the beach and he was like, I'm moving down here. Wow. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. So, I mean. It was good to see you guys all together. I mean, like, you know, like you never know with how these seasons go. Like sometimes animosity builds, sometimes great friendships build. That's right. But yeah, you guys, you guys look like you're having fun. Yeah. We had a great time there at the show. Um, Adam's man, Adam's just a great dude. He, um, he seems like it, man. Like his food looks amazing. He's so humble and chill. He's all of those things. And he, he just comes up with ideas about, sauces and ingredients that just things you don't ever think of. And I don't know if he's just always studied that. I never really got to talk to him about it, but he's, I, I told him, I said, Manny, you're going to do something amazing in culinary. You are, you are going to do something. And that's his passion. It really is. Now, Mert, Mert, yeah. Mert's in real estate as well. So we got together on that, that front and, and had a lot in common in the real estate world. And, uh, is he just as cocky in person as he <laughs> comes across on this TV show? Man, he, he's pretty cocky. He's pretty cocky, but it, it's, <laughs> it's a confidence in him. He really is confident. Sure. Um, but he doesn't mind, uh, you know, throwing a zinger at somebody and, and he takes them back well too, but he, he likes to pick. He really does. And I found it funny because I, you know, I'm one of the older guys, so I'm just laughing at his little routine. And, you know, I, yeah. I they are way younger than me. I, I used to, I used to be silly, you know, a long time ago. And yeah. I understand. But yeah, but those what those two look like. Yeah, they're good. They seem like good guys. Yeah, I I resonate with Mert a little bit because I remember in my younger days just being cocky with the drums and and you know, but it was coming from a place of confidence. It's like I know what I can do with this. Yeah, you guys yeah. just need to watch. That's right. You know, but th but then I learned that it just doesn't look so good. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. I mean, it's good to have. I believe you should have confidence. I believe. Uh, you have to have Got confidence to. to go far in this world. I know that uh, it's like making it on MasterChef. If you're not very confident of yourself, even if you don't have anything to back it, you have to be confident up front to where you exude confidence. You know, they must, they must feel it. Yeah. You got to be confident. You got to be a little naive. Uh, and you need a little bit of luck. A little bit of luck. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You need some luck there for sure. So, um, you got speaking of Mert, you got into this team challenge. Oh, yes, right. You were on Mert's team, right? That's right. You guys were together. Mert and Adam. Was, yeah, Mert and Adam. And who was captain on that one? That was Becca. 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 So uh, when we went when we went to the field, the soccer field, Anna had the immunity pin, and so she was able to pick a team to join with, and she did not pick our team. So we were we were there with the youngsters. Uh, Mert and, yeah. and and Becca, Adam, Fatima, and Haley, and uh, and we had a good team. We had a really good team, but we got there fairly late in the day. We did all that stuff you film, you know, the van and all the the transit stuff. Uh, had some food, and a cold front came through, and it got down in the forties. And they, in L in L A in L A. Yeah, it was crazy, and it, it, it was nighttime by this time. And the winds were just blowing like crazy. They had all the uh, heaters out. They rented heaters. They went and bought us blankets and all this stuff that I because it was unusual. And uh, and I'm not from the area, so I don't know if it never happens. But it was they acted like it was not a, a common thing. So we're in the stadium, and the winds just whipping through here. And when we decide, um, Anna gets to pick protein first, 
and they choose the fish, the halibut, and then we choose the steak um, over the lamb chops. And then you only, you know, team challenges, you only have the ingredients they have brought with them. And so they pick, we pick, they pick, we pick back and forth. And we got, yep. uh, I, I, I was put in charge of polenta. We picked polenta. And because my apron challenge was shrimp and grits, I was like, I can do polenta, no problem. So I got on the polenta station. Um, everything was going great. The polenta came up and... Gordon comes by and he's like, 10 minutes, I need that sample plate. 10 minutes. And I looked over at Adam and he was seasoning steak still. No steak in the pan. So I jumped over. I was like, you want me to start seasoning? I mean, to start searing these? And he was like, yeah. So I started searing and Gordon came over and he asked a question with an exclamation point on the end. And he said, you're searing those steaks to rare. And then off five minutes on the pickup, you're going to baste them in herb and butter, right? And I looked at him and I kind of froze because I'm used to putting it in the oven. And Adam and I started talking about reverse searing or searing and finishing in the oven. And we were like, Adam said, well, no, what, not to use the oven? And he said, did you not hear what I said? And he looked at me and he said, repeat what I said. And I said it back to him. And I just remember thinking, Chris, don't say herb. Don't say herb. Please say herbs like you're supposed to say. And uh, <laughs> and that was all going through my mind. So anyway, I said exactly what he said back. And I said, man, look, that's Gordon Ramsay, Adam. It's, there Maybe there's a way and we just don't know. And Adam was like, man, this is, I said, look, we'll pivot uh, if it doesn't work. And so the first steak for Gordon Adam, Adam basted and he sent it out and they loved it. They loved the planta. They loved the Brussels. Everything was, was great. And, uh, but not using that oven, we just set the steaks behind us seared to rare. And right. then we started getting to the steaks in the middle of the pile of steaks and, um, they were cold centered. So when I was grabbing them with the tongs, I couldn't even squish them. I was like, oh man, these are like half frozen in the center. So that's about the time we started to pivot to the oven anyway. So I was like, we'll be fine with this, but we only had the one oven. So we had six big cast iron pans going with the six steaks in each one and just rotating that around. And it, we couldn't get them out of my pan into Adam's pan. He was searing them for, he said, man, I'm, I'm searing these things 12 minutes. They're still rare in the center. And, it was so cold out. Yeah. And that's when we, that's when he came across those, the super overcooked ones. Because the crust was like five inches thick on this thing, it was crazy, and uh, and then yeah. he booted one to the second floor balcony, and uh, which was impressive, man. That was actually probably the coolest thing I got to see while I was there. I was just one. Of <laughs> he was just so mad, and I was I was pretty calm about it. I I knew where it, when it started going bad, I realized that we were in the weeds and that we probably weren't coming out of them because I was looking at the stakes behind me that we had let sit and get basically back to cold again. The wind was whipping. It doesn't, you can't tell, but the, we don't have any heaters where we are that, you know, you just got, I mean, you got right. one of it and I'm getting burned with all the steak, you know, searing all these steaks off and it was intense. So, uh, so we started using the oven to keep from burning the steaks and we could not get them. We had so many steaks in at once that were cold from behind us that we were just behind. So Gordon, you know, he's, constantly ripping us and he's pulling us up look at this steak touch it touch it and like you're this nothing none of this is helping he kept sending people to my station and they were like hey gordon told yeah. me to help you i was like you can help but i'm flipping all these steaks i'm putting them yeah. in the oven there's nothing we can do and about you know you're down the last 10 minutes of the competition and they're you know reminding you of the time and everything and i'm like even these steaks i'm cooking now will not make it to be plated you know, I'm I'm still cooking them, but I know this is not what we've done. Is all this is? If we get all the ones out the oven, we'll be happy. That's it. that's all we're gonna get. And so I already, I would already, I was already feeling pretty bad about how the the outcome was gonna go. But I always thought that I wasn't finishing the steaks, and I wasn't an expo or the team leader, team captain. So I still felt I was fairly safe, and. Uh, and then when they called us three, when Gordon called Becca, the team captain, Adam, who was finishing steaks, and me, who was searing the steaks up there, I started having this gut feeling. And I'm like, 
is it going to be me? It was the first time I thought, <laughs> oh, wait, I could go down right now. I really didn't think I was because you always hear that the, the captain – or the, the guy on the grill. But I was all of a sudden, I realized, wait, I'm one of the guys on the grill. I didn't have enough experience from watching the show to realize that was a dangerous place. And I should have stayed in Polenta because my Polenta was coming out great. It was it was phenomenal. They kept telling us how good it was. And, um, and, and but then I made that risky move, moving. I just saw my, my team needed the steak to be put in the pan and everybody was busy and I had taken control of the polenta and it was good. And I just had showed Fatima how to make it. So we were, we were uh, scaling up to like four batches at a time. Now that we had it worked out and we were in that process. And when I saw that, I said, can you do this Fatima? She said, I got it. And I jumped over there and I guess that was a rookie move on my part. Well, it's not a rookie move. I mean, it's definitely you being your age and, and who you are, like you would have, you could run that simulation over and over and over again, and you would have done the same thing. Yeah, still was like team looking out for team. But when I – after, when you look back, I said, you know, it's really not even a team – I mean, it is a team challenge because you're working together. You don't want any of your team to go home. But it also, at the same time, it feels like uh, that even if you don't do a good job, you're fairly safe for the from the odds. Yeah. Like there's only one person for right. one team. So – if you're yeah. the number one team, you're definitely not going home. If you're number two team, only one person's going. So I, I, I didn't wish it on either one of Becca or Adam. I didn't want them to go home either. I didn't want to go home. I wasn't really ready to go home. But when they told me, I had this like free feeling of, well, I get to go home to my family. I get to finally get back yeah. in the kitchen, get to see my animals, my friends, my family. So I had this moment where I'm out on the field. Everybody, they'd taken all the other contestants uh, away and, I was separate and I was just by myself and I was on this great big field just all by myself. And the one camera guy setting up camera and my, my uh, producers around and uh, waiting on everything to get set up. And I was just looking around. I was just very thankful to be there. Very uh, humbled by the experience. Cause I just got my butt handed to me, you know, trying to cook 101 steaks. Um, but I was very thankful for some weird reason. I was like, this is an incredible experience. Uh, amazing night you know it, it was still chilly out there and i was still cold but i'd been behind the stakes for you know a couple hours or whatever it is 90 minutes and so uh i was burned all over the place on my arms from the grease and and uh but it was it was just like i was happy to go but kind of sad that i wasn't staying but i was um i was very thankful i just remember how thankful i was just looking around i was like i'm the only one in the stadium this is like a beautiful yeah. place it's amazing the green grass and all the lights were on and so it was very peaceful. It was a peaceful moment. And now it now it lives online and on TV forever. forever. And you know, as your <laughs> as your kids get older, you can always reference it as, "Hey, you know, take the chance, take the risk." Right? That's exactly right. I I tell my kids, I'm like, you can do anything you want if you commit to it. It's just a matter of committing and focusing and utilizing the time you have to put towards that one thing. Now, if you do like. You know, a hundred things, you can't master any of them. But if you really want something, if you master it, you can do yeah. it. Yeah, the steak, you know, for anyone that is, you know, a future Master Chef contestant, the hardest, one of the hardest challenges is that first team challenge because y'all have never worked like that together. You're in an element that you've probably never been before and you're cooking an amount of, amount of food that you've never cooked before. And then you have this side of Gordon Ramsay you haven't seen <laughs> yeah. before. Like you've seen it on TV, but it's different in person because there's a lot more times that he's yelling at you that doesn't make camera. And he's so fierce and intense. And, uh, you know, the, that moment where he comes and like you said, and you, you'll remember it forever when he, when he, when he said, this is, this is how you're searing it. Right. And, and, or how you're cooking it. Right. And it's like, that's his, that's his moment where he's giving you the Michelin star advice and you, you have to do it that way and you got to figure out how to make it work. Yeah. And those elements obviously were against you, but you know, I mean, I'm just looking at it like, yeah, the, it's just such a tough <laughs> spot to be in. And then, and then you're like fighting the elements, but it's like, how how could you have done it? Like, what would have made it work? Yeah, with his, you know, and then, 
And and I was like, man, doing fish, like that's crazy. But now knowing how cold it was. Yeah. Fish was the way to go. That's right. It was, it was extremely cold and the steaks, not all of them, the first several we had. um, But Adam told me at some point, I was like, man, I was with the tongs. I was like, man, these steaks are frozen in the center. He's like, yeah, a bunch of words. I was seasoning them. I was hoping that they would thaw out. I was like, man, it's too cold out here to thaw. Um, these are, are going to be, this is going to be tough, but we had already like committed to, to changing, get in the oven. And it was, it was too late. Then if we would have started with like a reverse sear, I think we would have been closer to pulling it off. It would have looked better, but, um, I know they need that little bit of drama in there. They need that. Yeah. But Gordon, you know, a lot of people don't realize how tall Gordon is. He's so tall. And so you're used to seeing people on TV. And then when you see him in real life, they're smaller. So when he's enraged at you, he's taller than you. It's it's yep. a scary thing, and and I I mean I kept my cool. I wasn't like afraid of him or or worried about what he was saying. I was trying to tweak what we were doing and just do better. And it, we were just yeah. behind at the beginning. Yeah. Speaking of behind, real quick, what do you got behind you here? Oh, I do lots of canning. Um, so I have like tomato sauces from this season. I go to a an organic you pick it field. Um in Mississippi, not far from my house. And I've been going every year and I get about four or 500 pounds of tomatoes, a couple hundred pounds of cucumbers. And I make pickles, tomato sauce, uh, salsa. Uh, I can the beans and peas. I even, um, I harvest my own chickens and ducks. So sometimes I'll can the meat and I'll, cause I don't have enough freezer space or whatever the case is. And so I'll turn it into a dish and, and then can all that. And then that way I've got like what you would buy in the store is a, a can of soup or whatever. I have that. I've got a uh, leek and potato soup, and, um, some, some peppers. These are stocks. I got uh, beef stock, shrimp stock, uh, deer stock. Um, a friend of mine harvests deers uh, during hunting season and he'll bring them to me and I, I'll process them and split the meat with them. And so I'll, I'll do lots of crazy things, making the stock and getting fat, rendering fat and things beans dude when the world when the world goes to shit i'm coming to your place and come see me man <laughs> <laughs> i try to live up. i need to come down any i need to come down anyway i'm gonna be in dallas here pretty soon which isn't too far from me right like no it's about eight or nine hours man you ought to actually really come see me and let me know and i'll try to get that place in my, my beach house opened up for us and we go down there and just cook i would love man that'd be so cool super cool hell yeah make some videos do some cooking stuff hang out at the yeah beach. so what uh, so you got, dude, I, I wish that we had a camera crew following you around with all your canning <laughs> stuff. That's a, that's a whole channel and niche that you need on the internet, but you know, exiting the uh, podcast room in real life was something I've never seen before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wish we were recording on that one. That was funny. <laughs> when, when, uh, when I remodeled this house we're living in. And these are bookshelves behind me, and there's one on each side of this fireplace. And we moved in a hurry and really didn't have this house 100% finished. I had like half the house really going and and one of the bathrooms working. But we had to get out because we had tenants moving in our house. So I started moving all my canned goods from over there and because it's some of the heaviest things I have, and it's breakable, and it's a pain. And so I was bringing them in, and I started just putting them on the shelf so they didn't get dusty and dirty and painted on and everything from construction. And I moved them in and I came back and my wife's like, I love this. We should keep them here. <laughs> I was like, really? Yeah, super cool. And I organized them and kind of put them in, into their sections and, and uh, made them where I can use them. So now it's part of my pantry and I just, um, I'm constantly adding to this and then I'm constantly taking yeah. out of it and using it. That's super cool. So what? obviously you have your real estate business. What do you got? What do you got? Uh plan what do you got coming up what's what's the future looking like food wise and so much yesterday i went on the local news and had a good time cooking a dish i got a couple of friends that own restaurants and so we've been talking about doing some kind of a um maybe seasonally uh like a restaurant takeover type of thing at yeah. their place and uh doing some some dishes from the show some dishes i didn't get to use on the show uh, just some things yeah. on my Cajun cooking. I like really the, the the Cajun cooking that I that I loved as a kid, along with like French techniques. I love the French techniques and how nice they are together. And a lot of New Orleans cooking is French technique. It's a French uh, city anyway, so um, I love those those types of dishes. Uh, I'm, I'm up for anything. 
I'm up for doing any kind of cooking. I actually cooked for um my great uncle, the one that tried the food, 95 years old, for his 95th birthday. I did uh, service for 40. And uh, first time I had done that on my own with just a couple people helping. And that went extremely well. Everybody's happy. And uh, they invited me to come back and cook and everything. So I'm just, I'm, That's I'm just up for whatever. You're enjoying the ride. Enjoying the ride, man. Uh, what about you? How did how did this work for you when you um, when you came home from Master Chef the first or second time? Yeah, so I mean, the first time social media wasn't really what it was. Like, I remember, so I was still playing drums uh, for this pop group, and I remember we were on the way we were on the way to uh, play uh, Jingle Ball, uh, the big Kiss FM show. And I remember just Instagramming the 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 Sour Patch Kids I was eating sitting in the back of the the ride to the venue, and like so like Instagram was not this like plethora of food and reels and engagement. It just wasn't that yet. Um, so I was I was just doing a lot of hustling through Facebook, like booking private dinners. And then I started just getting so many private dinners around the country, around North America, because I did, I've done a lot in Canada and Mexico too. Wow. So I was just, I was just getting emails and phone calls like crazy from just all over the country. And it wasn't really through social media so much. I mean, Facebook messages, I, I definitely like, I, I tell everyone I ruined my Facebook because I, I started getting messages and there were. Like, and the only way you could see the messages are you accepted friends. So I started accepting everyone's friend request. Oh. And now I look at my Facebook and I'm like, I don't know any of these people, but, yeah. but it's because <laughs> people were booking, booking me for a private dinner and they saw what I did on the show and they're like, we want to try this. Um, so I spent a good, like solid two years just flying around the country, driving around, you know, like doing, doing public pop-ups and private dinners for families of, you know, 10 or more. And, and, uh, it was a lot of hustle and it was, it was a grind, but at the same time it was like very fruitful and like, you know, like <laughs> the money was just coming in. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then before COVID I, I was doing, I was doing the, the traveling, but like, you know, the, the hype wears off new seasons of MasterChef air. And then like the food scene on, on Instagram was like taken off at the same time that I was like going into the restaurants. And so I wasn't filming myself cooking. I started cooking. Uh, I started chef chefing at a couple restaurants and it was just taking up my time completely. And then I kind of didn't like the way that there was like sabotage and like everyone wants to have a say in your menu. And I'm like, then what, what then what am I doing here? Well, you yeah. know? So then I had a friend give me an opportunity to cook, uh, as a private chef, um, for a big time celebrity. And I was like, and it was only for a couple of weeks. She was going out of town and she needed, she needed somebody to fill in. I got recommended and, I was like, wait a minute, this is crazy money and I just got to cook for one person. Oh. I was like, I like this. Yes. Um, and so then a few months after I ended that job, I, I, I did some more pop-ups, some private dinners, and then back into a restaurant and then I hated it. And then I had another friend call me. He's like, hey, I got a really big gig. It's a private gig for um, for some royalty. Wow. My second, my like second private chef gig, wow. like full-time private chef gig was for a prince. <laughs> and, uh, it's crazy. Pretty cool. And there were so many people in the house and there were security guards and there was drivers and there was nannies and every single person had their own nanny. And then there was a manager that managed all the nannies. And I mean, the house was so big. There was a walk-in refrigerator in the house. Wow. And there was, there was six refrigerators total in the kitchen. That's how big the kitchen was. Like it was massive. And we did that for like almost three months. And I went from like barely getting by to like, like literally coming home and just like throwing cash in the air. I'm like, this is crazy. And, uh, and I was like, this is what I want to do. 
And so then from there, like I got another private chef gig and then, and, and then you get referred and another one comes and then it was like another one comes. And then I was like, before I know it, like, man, now I've cooked for A-list celebrities, royalty. Now I'm cooking for an athlete. And then, and then COVID hits oh. and the world just seems like it's falling apart. And I was doing actually with some really cool uh, pop-ups because I had these like, I had these private chef gigs that had gave me the opportunity to also go cook and do pop-ups and then COVID hit. And I had just started this pop-up series called the Fox Den. And I was doing, I did a 13 course pop-up dinner for eight people. It was like super intimate to, it was, I think I did, I charged like $275 a person Nice and and did 13 courses and it was fucking it was so badass and then covid hit and uh but then my phone started ringing like crazy because in LA wealthy famous people like can't go anywhere and, you, and they don't know how to cook yeah yeah and so my phone was ringing like crazy i was booking chefs on different jobs and and then um i got this job with an nba player and i i just cooked for him Literally, I did a hundred days in a row, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What? And yeah. And I wasn't telling anybody about it because everybody else was posting on Facebook. Like their, their life is over. They, they've lost their job. They don't, they don't have money. Yeah. And I'm sitting here like literally like invoicing this guy for so much. And I'm like, this is, this is crazy. Yeah. That is a good gig right there. Cause you can just really experiment and do so much at that point. I would think that that's just a nice place. You can't, you can't because, because you get, you also got to remember like the private, you're, you're not exper You're not really cooking to experiment. You're cooking to feed somebody daily. Okay. So, you know, it's like, you're really trying to just elevate and make really just good everyday food. So, I mean, like when I was cooking for coups, like he loved, he loved pancakes. He loved burritos. He loved, uh, he did love my lamb. Like once a week we'd do rack of lamb oh, and yeah. he would just fucking crush it. Yes. But then he went to the bubble and uh, his manager didn't put me on retainer. And I was like, dude, you're going to be gone. And I got to not work. Like that, d that doesn't work. Like, you know, I have to keep working yeah. or you have to put me on retainer. Cause I can't promise I'll be here when you get back. If you don't put me on retainer and his manager didn't. And so, in that time, he was gone for three months down in the bubble uh, competing for that championship, and they won. But in that time, the I, I put feelers out. This family was in Malibu at their vacation home because they were, you know, trying to hide from COVID. And I started cooking for them, and then I went to tell them, like, hey, uh, my basketball player's coming back. They're like, we want you to stay with us. And they gave me a really nice offer. I couldn't refuse. and. And wow. gave me a contract. So I was like, all right. <laughs> wow. So, and they live in they live in Dallas and they live here in LA. They go back and forth. They spend about six months in each. So I've been traveling back and forth with them, which you know, it's it's an amazing gig and I love cooking for these people, but it's also very hard because I don't get to do the pop ups like I used to. Um and that really that hurts me creatively. Um because during COVID, like for most of half the time I've cooked for these people, it was during COVID. We were not, we were not doing things in public. It was like, we got to keep all of us healthy and safe. And then it was like, oh, they finally got COVID and they survived. And they were like, oh, okay. <laughs> so now, yeah. you know, the world's opened back up and the, pri the private chef world is, is fun, but sometimes it can be golden handcuffs, you know, like, so... I don't know. I'm still figuring it out. I imagine the money's good, but everything comes with a cost. I mean, you're doing something over and over and over for the same people. I could imagine that could wear too. Yeah. Well, it's tough because like, you know, like for the most, most of my job, I'm one person in my own kitchen. I have my own chef's kitchen at their house. So I'm, I don't get bothered by anybody. I'm just like, out there doing my thing on my own. That's awesome. But then some days you're like, ah, man, I, this is, you know, 35 days of work in a row that I haven't talked to anybody else. <laughs> yeah. That could be challenging. Like, and you're going to their place. You're staying with them. 
No, I have my own. I have my own place in LA, and I have my own place in Dallas. Gotcha. Makes sense. You know, I, but it's like when you when you're working, sometimes growth doesn't happen unless you work with other people. Sure. You know, like you can't you can't become like the best chef in the world if you only work by yourself. That's right. You only have one palate, and you only have one set of skills, and you only know what you know. You never introduce. That's the part when going to Master Chef that I really brought home the most was talking to different people and them giving me, like you said, people give you a lot of their secrets. They, people were just telling me all their, I mean, I was doing the same thing. I was telling people, but I didn't feel like I had anything to hold back. I wasn't like, uh, some of the people there were much more talented professionally than I was. Um, I just, yeah, but you know, like what with a lot of them, they'll talk because they've seen it or they've read it or whatever, or they've tried it, but they're like, there was this dude, Chris on on my first season that like just would not shut up about all the things he knew, but then he just like couldn't cook. And it was like, dude, like, it's in your head, but you don't know how to make it happen. So like, you're just white noise to me. Like, yeah. stop talking. Like, just stop talking. Well, you got to be able to. Uh, you got to be able to follow up what you say. You just have to. Yeah, and sometimes it's better to not say anything and then just show them what you can do. That's right. That's but, always the best. Anyway. Well, Chris, I got to wrap this up because I got to get going to my private chef gig so they can eat dinner tonight. But real quick, one question for you. Okay. If you could cook, if you could cook for one dead celebrity, who would it be and why? One dead celebrity, huh? Interesting. That's a, that's a tough one because I would have to think this through a little better. I would just say uh, one person that I would, I would like to cook for, I would think, is because uh, my first cookbooks were from Paul Perdon. In Louisiana. Oh, okay. And he's gone now, and he's an influential person of that I cook a lot of. The spices I use are similar in some of the methods because that's kind of where I learned it. So pairing those spices and and learning how to use the um, the Trinity, the Holy Trinity, and 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 all that stuff, and using the weir pot and all that. Just all that came from the, the first cookbooks I got, and they were both his. My first, my very first cookbooks. And so that would be cool. That would be, wouldn't that be scary to cook for him? Yeah, that'd be scary, <laughs> but I think he was also like a very loving person. I would have loved to have met him. I think that he would be like, oh man, this is good, but let me show you something. That's how I imagine that going. I, I, as far as celebrities, I don't know. I couldn't come up with another one. Okay, but how about, okay, so not just dead. How about dead or alive? Anybody, anybody you could cook for right now? You know, I'd like to cook for Gordon Ramsay. He might not be my number one choice, but I would like to cook for him and him have to eat the meal and have have some time to get it right. And just uh, because he had you, you hear him rip through everybody's plate there in the, the kitchen. And he has a lot of information that I got from him ripping into everybody's dish. Like, why would you do that to that piece of meat? Why would you do this? And it's like. It's beautiful knowledge if you can take it as like learning. Uh, but yeah. you, hear, you hear like 10 or 20 different plates get ripped into. And and I learned a lot just from hearing like, why would you do that? Why would you pair that with that? Like that never works. And so then from there, I'm like, well, maybe I ought to pay attention to that. So that would be that would be cool because I think you would get the most feedback from him. You know, he can be nurturing. Yeah. And also if you could cook for him in an environment where it's not like stressed under pressure. Yeah. and Because you have cooked. You have cooked for Gordon Ramsay. Yeah, but you're talking Ramsay. like yeah, sit- yeah. I mean, but but you know, in a in sit a sit down dinner where he was like at your house, so he wasn't trying to do it for the camera, and it was just him telling. I just I feel like I would do a fairly decent job for that, you know, especially if I could prepare for it. Um, yeah. You know, Aron Sanchez was really cool. I would love to invite him to my house. He actually asked me when I uh, when I got booted. He said, uh, Chris, anytime you want to come to New Orleans and uh, cook with me, you're welcome. And I'm definitely going to take him up on that offer. I got to find out how to reach him and contact him. But I'm definitely going to uh, do that yeah. now that the show's over for me. Whoever was like, um, like for us, it was JC. Did you have JC? Was he on? Do you remember JC? Uh, no, no. We had um, as the celebrity guests or just. No, no, the per- like your person that you that was like in contact with you, like getting to the show, oh. not the handlers, but like JC like was exactly. is one. It is okay. So JC could help you. Reach out to JC and say, "Hey, Aron said he would really like for me to if I came down that I could cook." And JC can set that up, or he can put you in the right direction. And that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, he's the one that 
um, that I I get stuff from still. So yeah, awesome. He can be a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, he's been a pain in my ass, and he knows it. But uh, he can also be very helpful, and and I I appreciate him being an ass sometimes. Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. It's nice to have the resources like that because yeah, I, I want to go cook down there for a row, and that's I guess that would probably be my 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 live celebrity because I don't know many, I guess. So I would definitely go go cook for him. Or just have them over for dinner, man. That would be awesome. Just awesome. Yeah. Yeah. What about you? What's All right, man. Chris. Oh, for me, for me, who would I cook for? Uh, Dead celebrity. It's funny. I always ask this question, but I don't really think about it. <laughs> I think like cooking for like Kurt Cobain would be pretty wild. That would be awesome. That's a great one. Man. That's a great one. Or or uh, Freddie Mercury. Freddie Mercury like, would have been cool. The, sitting down with those two and just like, I don't know, because like, I mean, Kurt Cobain, like when he showed up, he changed. He literally himself changed the trajectory of music. Yeah. I mean, like 80, 80s hair bands were <laughs> taking over the fucking world, Man. and then he showed up. He showed up it grungy just, as dirty as fuck. It was just like a whole new genre was there. built like overnight. It was insane overnight and and crushed the music industry. So that that would be a really that would be a really cool one. And I was just thinking you talked about music. I was thinking about Mike D from uh, Beastie Boys, one of my favorite bands. Oh and he just yeah, died of cancer not too many years ago. That would be really cool to have just have met him and cooked yeah. for somebody. Now that I know how to cook, it'd be nice to cook for people. <laughs> But uh, I feel like you've always known how to cook. <laughs> I feel, and then I feel like alive, alive. I would love to cook for Elon Musk. Dang, that's a good one. That's a good one. That would be a nice yeah. conversation as he's sitting there eating your food, just to have a good conversation with him. It's a smart guy. Yeah, dude, he's unbelievably smart. I listen to all his stuff. Not, I mean, like, like I listen to it for two reasons. Like, one to make sure, like, because the media spins everything. So it's like if you listen to the actual conversations he's having then I can be an actual judge of what's being said. Yes. And th they spin his shit so much. This dude, he loves, he loves humanity so much. And he, he wants the future of our species to be longer than we are actually set out for. So, uh, you know, I think he's, he is man in a hundred years, we're going to look, you know, whoever's on this planet is going to look back and go, we're here because of this guy. That's right. That's right. There's so much that can happen to yeah. our poor little planet. That uh, he's trying to take us elsewhere. It's pretty cool. Yeah, super yeah. cool. All right, Chris. Uh, let's stay in touch, yes. and when we can schedule something, I'll come on down to Alabama, dude. Come, please schedule <laughs> it. I'll get us a spot down in my beach house, a four bedroom, so we can pile in there, set up some lights and cameras, do some cooking, man. That'd be awesome. That'd be cool. That'd be a good time.